Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something
that, that uh, pavilion, and that's why we're going to do that. And we'll just keep looking at that. Maybe we'll make the list of what we're going to bring. Well, that's uh, that's fine. Okay, you're in charge. Oh. All right. See. <laughs> so you now, now you'll never ever ever do that, even though. Yeah. You know that would be great. I mean, I don't mind uh, if. Uh, you kind of let let people know what you're bringing or something like that. I don't. I, I just know that you guys do a very good job of sharing that way. That is bringing food, and, and we we certainly don't have a hard time eating. I can tell you that we, we do a good job. Uh, the fellowship is even sweet. It really is a good time that we'll, we'll be there together. Uh, beware of uh, birthdays and anniversaries as they come for this month. And uh, tonight we will be continuing in Revelation uh, as uh, Jimmy's teaching that and uh, doing a very good job of, of that for us. Uh, he won't finish tonight and then he's off for two weeks. So then we'll be back because Father's Day we also do not have uh, evening services following that on Father's Day. So we're, we're glad that that's going on. Just a moment, I want to uh, lead in prayer. Uh, as I was uh, coming out of the other building, a uh, Franklin County Sheriff's Department vehicle came into the into our lot, and uh, uh, Officer uh, uh, Jim, uh, or, I'm sorry, Jeff Skidmore was in, in that vehicle. Uh, they come by and, and check things all the time. Uh, well, I'm saying all the time, but you know, every once in a while, I get a little note, I find a note on the door that says that they've come by and just, you know, looked around the property. He says he doesn't like to leave a note because uh, he said that his training officer told him that if you leave a note, they'll read it and say they were glad you're there, and then they think he's, he's never coming back. So, but he was here. And it was, I, there weren't any, out, I asked him, there weren't any outstanding warrants on anybody from the church. <laughs> we were good, we were good. But I did ask if we could pray for him, and I said that we would uh, specifically pray for him today. And uh, he appreciated that. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, as you pray, remember uh, well, all of our, our men and women who serve uh, in our police and sheriff departments. Um, it's uh, not always, an, as you know, an easy job for them. But uh, specifically, uh, pray for uh, Jeff Skidmore. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Fathers, we come this morning and we just want to thank you for the time we could be here, that you have allowed us to get up this morning, to get ready this morning, to, our cars to work right, ever we made it here, Lord. And we're here. And we're in your presence. This morning isn't about us. It's about you. It always is about you. It should be. May we bring all that we are to you this morning. May we open our hearts to hear your words, to sense your presence through your spirit, and to be obedient to your moving in whatever way that is. For we've come to worship. Father, we also know that we have members of our congregation who are not with us this morning for whatever reason. Some of it is health reasons. Some of it, Lord, is that uh, there may be folks who just, they can't get here anymore. So we ask a blessing upon them. Some of our folks are recovering from surgery. We ask that you be with them. Some of our folks are away with family. We ask that you be with them. Lord, we want to lift up to you very specifically Officer Skidmore and, and his uh, family, for those men and women that he works with, and yes, Father, for those that they look after at the county jail, that you will bring into their hearts a change through Jesus Christ. May we, may we follow you as good disciples, as good learners. And we listen. And when we come and sing this morning, may you 
inhabit the praise coming from our lips. I pray also that it comes from our hearts. May you be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. Out of all my acquaintances, I only know two Peggy Pauls, and they're both here this morning, Dorothy and George. We missed you, and it's good to have you back. Brother Errol told me on Wednesday night that his sermon today will be the third of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We certainly don't want to do that, but we do want to glorify and praise His name, and we'll do that in song this morning. Would you stand along with the choir? Turn to number 493, Glory to His Name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of Glorify thy name. 
Jesus, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. some special music this morning. Last week, Rebecca Darden was on scheduled sing, but she had other things to do, so she's here this morning instead.
Thank you, Rebecca. J.D. and I attend a lot of bluegrass music festivals, and that's a song we almost always hear there. But that third verse, I had never heard before. A song written by Albert Brumley. Good song. Pastor Darrell Williams. Hey, uh, before we get into this, just say uh, this one thing. We talk about glorifying the name of Jesus, glorifying the Lord, glorifying God. And we understand, sometimes we want to know, what does that mean? How do you do that? How do you do that? I had a very wise uh, pastor. I would you know. Sir, I left my first three pages in my office. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably upside down. Uh, can you get in over there? Probably not. It's yeah, locked. Okay. All right. Sorry about you starting to put this over here and looked and said, that's not my first page. Anyway, what I had to say was not on that first page. How do you glorify God? I had a real wise uh, professor in seminary who asked a bunch of seminary students that very question. How do you glorify God? He tells us that we should glorify God. How do you do that? Because he was about practical things as well as teaching theology because that is one of the courses that he taught was a course on theology. He said this, and I thought, that's good. He didn't start listing things because all of us, in some ways, it may be a little bit different in how we glorify God. But what he did say was, you act as if God matters to you. When you act as if God matters to you, you are glorifying God. For he has said in some of the confessions that the chief end of man is to glorify God. God did not create us because he needed us, but in creating us, he created us so that we could glorify Him, that is, that we could act as if we matter. And then the things that we do, you see, it brings glory and points to God, not to ourselves. The other day in, in a meeting at, at work, someone said, well, well, they said something, not that we are pointing fingers, and, and you know, of course when you point fingers, one finger, you got three back at you. So it, when I started pointing fingers in the in the in the meeting, I just pointed all four back at me. You know, I'll take it. Go ahead. You know, I'm pointing fingers. But uh, we really do. It's all about God, and we say that, but we always don't act as if He matters in our life. Often, it's, well, he's out there somewhere. He's over here somewhere. Let me just push him aside for this moment or for today even until I get to the end of the day and, and I say, oh, my goodness, I, God, hey, how are you? Kind of thing. Did you find him? Oh, David, you left David as a messenger? All right. I want to pay for this. Well, I can get to the first part of it. That is just it. Turn to your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, but I'll be saying that for the next seven weeks too. So, I'm serious if you haven't turned in your Bibles to Exodus page, uh, chapter 20. It's page 95 in my Bible, but yours is going to be different. I am reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, and uh, let me ask if you would to stand as in honor of God's word as we look at this together. I'm looking at verse 7. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Ray quoted from King James Version, and I think it, uh, the version that I read helps kind of explain what this means. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. May God add his blessing to the speaking of his word. Please be seated. If you 
If you were like me, when you learned the Ten Commandments, and I did so when I was young, you came to this one and you just said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay, what does that mean? If you were like me, what it mean was don't cuss. I mean, that, that's what it meant for me. You're not supposed to cuss. And then uh, I remember one day on the playground in third grade, I don't know why exactly, but someone came to me and said, Derek, Derek Walker is taking the name of the Lord in vain. So I went over to Derek and I said, Derek, don't take the name of the Lord your God. I don't know what Derek said. He didn't tell me. The other person didn't tell me. He just told me. So I told Derek. <laughs> The, the neatest thing, though, is Derek Walker uh, now is a missionary in Africa, and they are building a, a uh, wellness center. They're building a place in a village, and he lives in a country that is predominantly Muslim, and the village he lives in is predominantly Muslim. Uh, but they are building it, and he's building relationships and different things. Uh, he was a pastor for many years uh, in uh, First Iowa. Caught up with him again, so a friend telling him he, he was in Lone Oak, Arkansas. Thing was, we were passing Lone Oak, Arkansas for years and years and years as we went to Texas to see uh, uh, Cherry's mom. And then uh, the last time I was going there, he'd already gone. He'd gone off to Africa, so I wasn't able to try and find him or anything. But you know, it was important for some reason to communicate that. But what it was about was cussing. The thing is, this verse is really more than that. The question in the title of the sermon, uh, Alistair Begg is the one I'm taking these uh, outlines from. Uh, the question is, wh what's in the name? And names are important, aren't they? Yes. But if they weren't important, then, you know, let's think about it, at least in my generation, Every mom and dad, you know, spend an amazing amount of time trying to determine what their children's names are going to be. And of course, if you were like uh, us, uh, you would uh, be aware of, if not purchase, a book that had names in it. And you alphabetically, you, know, you went through the name. Did, did anybody go do that at all? Yeah, thanks, Diana was the only one that would be it's brave, oh, brave enough to do it. Oh, you, you, so you didn't have to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I knew a, I had a teen in one of my uh, youth groups and we'd go somewhere and we might visit a mall. She'd go into, into a mall and she was a speed reader so she'd grab a, she'd look at a book and you know, check out the books, look at it. She, so she'd read the book and, and didn't purchase it, just put it back. But that's what she did. But you do that, don't you? I mean, you go through them and, and you go, how about, nah, that reminds me of some girl in, in high school and I did not like it. She was mean to me and no way am I naming a kid that. Well, how about this? Uh-uh, that was my boss, first boss and he was terrible. How about this? Not, uh, I mean, we go on and on. We, we, we just can't figure it out. We, we go through all these names and you know, you get to the labor room and you say, did you bring the book? No. Well, then how are we gonna do this? But names are important. And they really are important. Uh, especially in the African context or an Asian context and early on even in in our uh, uh, land earlier days they were important now I want to tell you a story uh, of a name and uh, it's a story of a lawyer a story of a lawyer his name was odd ODD and so uh, all through his life people used to phone him up and say hey is this oddball or hey that you odd guy and uh, he was plagued by the name, so consequently, uh, in his will, when he died, he, he specifically left instructions that he did not want his name on the tombstone. And, you know, he had trouble enough with it through his life, so he didn't want to, it to follow him in death. So instead, he had the inscription placed on his tombstone, Here lies an honest lawyer. People would walk by and go by and say, that's odd. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I had, couldn't, couldn't have. But we, we understand that, that names say something, they mean something, that names are significant. Now, if that's true on a horizontal plane, then it should be on, on a vertical, transcendental plane when we come to God, when we think about that. 
And I want us to think about what that means to us and, and really, what does this commandment mean for us? I think if you were honest with yourself, if, if someone gave, gave you a list of the Ten Commandments and you, you said, okay, which one of these is the least significant? They're all significant. I mean, which one of these is the least significant? I might say that maybe number three. Because, again, if I think it's only about cussing and I don't do a whole lot of cussing, then I'm doing pretty good with number three. But we need to understand that that's not really what it means. Now, we have to understand as we've gone through, if we use the name of God wrongly, if we misuse his name, it tells us that we can incur his wrath. Guilt. You will not be blameless. You will not be guiltless, it says. But I want us to take a look really at the importance to begin with of the name of God or the names of God. And I want to start to say God's name is precious. God's name is precious. The name of God, the unique name of God, the proper name of God, and we translate that in our Bibles. And if you want to look at that any time in your English Bible where you see the word LORD, all caps, L-O-R-D, they're all capitalized. That is the Hebraic uh, per, uh, translation, if you will. Uh, uh, not it's, a, it's Hebraic, I said that wrong. It's the translation of the Hebrew Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. Now you might see the word Lord with a capital L and an O-R-D. That's not that name. Anytime in our scripture, in our Bible, when you see all caps, L-O-R-D, it's the, the Hebraic Y, I mean, yeah, Y-H-W-H. And Hebrew is a language without vowels. So you have to figure out what the vowels were. If you take Hebrew today, it has what's called vowel points in it to help you figure out which vowel you're supposed to use. You have a yod and a hey and a vav and a hey. We say Yahweh. Yahweh. When you think about it, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it in a different, little bit different way, and this is for another time, but I'm going to inhale and exhale. It tells us that when God made man, he breathed in. Again, some other time, but the whole name and the concept of the breath of God when we say his name. Almost gives me chills talking about it. Actually, it does. Larry, you kept it cold in here, didn't you? It's good. It's good. His name is precious. When we read in the early chapters in the Pentateuch, beginning of the Bible, there's really only one place where one individual used the name of God. And that was on the Day of Atonement in Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the priest, it says in Leviticus 23, he took the name Yahweh upon his lips. The fact of the matter is we need to understand it was very precious. In fact, if a Jew was writing this out later on when they wrote scripture, wrote it so people could have it. They would stop before they wrote it and they would do a cleansing, a ritual bath and come back and write and, and afterwards cleanse. And, so, and even Christians, when they were writing, there were times when they came to the word of God in the Bible when, when the monks were doing it, they would stop before they wrote it because it was very precious I want to say this, and I will say it a little bit later, it's not magical. 
Okay? But they saw that the name of God meant something. And it was supremely precious. I want to look at two places in Scripture very quickly. Encounters that God had with Moses. And they teach us about the precious nature of his name. One's in Exodus chapter 33, and then we'll go back to Exodus 3. In Exodus 33, uh, God meets with Moses, and it, sometime read that chapter, 33 and 34. I mean, we're not going to do it now, but I want to talk to us as we do this. When he meets with Moses, Moses makes a request of God in verse 13. He says, if you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. By the way, God had already called the Israelites a stiff-necked people. He was getting fed up with, in some ways, with the way that they were behaving. And so this is part of what is the context of this. Then in verse 18, Moses says, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, or Yahweh, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I, I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then he said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And we will find out that he says, you'll go in that rock, and I'm in a cleft of that rock. There's a song for you. And he put his hand over him. And he passed by. And we go on into chapter 34. It does say that the Lord came down in a cloud, verse 5 of chapter 34, and proclaimed his name. In your Bible it says, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. In other words, he was not just saying his name twice, but he explains what he's saying when he is saying his name compassionate and gracious God. What is God like? He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love and faithfulness. He maintains love to thousands. He forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He is a just God and therefore does not leave the guilty unpunished. This is who he is as he proclaimed his name. By the way, the words that are found there about God being uh, gracious and merciful, those are found at least five other times exactly like that in the Old Testament. The implications of this, as we look at that, is that my name embodies my character. Who I am is what you hear in my name. And God's name is precious. And by his name, God betrays his greatness. He reveals all that he is and all that he does. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 3. There we have an encounter with God and Moses in the burning bush. And there God tells Moses, this is what I want you to do. He says, you know, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. So Moses, being Moses, says to God, in verse 13 of chapter 3, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? And God said, I am. God is, I am. God is, I am. Now that sounds kind of funny, isn't it? In some ways. If I go to them and say, The God, Elohim, Word it used, which is just the plural of the word El, which means God. If I tell them that the God of your fathers has sent me, and they say, Tell me his name, what am I supposed to say? And God says, And I'm going to reveal to you, and I'm going to let them know who I am. And it, it is a name that is so immense and grander, and it's so huge in power that even the name Elohim, with, which we find even in Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. That that word, not in all the words of mass, can even begin to express who I am. And so, if they ask you that question, just use the verb to be. I am who I am. God says that. You're just saying to them, I am has sent me to you. You got it? Does it make sense to you?
There's no way Moses could explain to him how great he was other than I am. God is the am, the, 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 the creator. He is. But we looking at that. Because really when he looks at the verb to be, and by using this, God expresses the essence of his character. He reveals the fact that he is self-existent, that he's self-sufficient, that he is sovereign, that he depends on no one and depends on nothing. Now, who else in all creation can take that as their name? Who else do you know who is self-existent, self-fulfilled, in need of no one, in need of nothing, and altogether sovereign? You know anybody like that? The answer is you don't know. And I don't either. There is no one else. So I am who I am, says God. Tell them it is I am who sent you. Now let's go from Moses' time, and you don't have to look, but in your own mind understand this. We're going from Moses to Jesus. And Jesus got in trouble because he said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was saying when he said that. They said, that's God's name. And he said, that's right. I'm self Existence. I'm self-sufficient. I'm sovereign. I need no one, and I need nothing. And when he said that, I am, they understood. And that's why they got upset with him. That's why they said he blasphemed God. That's why they were mad at him. And we need to remember, and a reminder us as we go in passing, that the God whom we worship, the God of Scripture, is not a God of some cosmic discovery, nor is it a God of our own creation. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is Father, He is Son, He is Holy Spirit. He is both plural and perfect and powerful and praiseworthy. And all of that is revealed in His name. Jeremiah understood this, and he said in Jeremiah 10.6, There's none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. The psalmist in Psalm 20, verse 7 said, Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we trust in or remember the name of the Lord our God. Jesus' great triumphant prayer in John 17.6 says, I have manifested your name, or I have made known to them your name. That means something more than simply saying that God is God. Because he's expressing something of his character, of his power, of his control, of his influence in all the world. And it's not until we grasp that that we can understand what the third commandment is all about and why it is significant. If God is just down here somewhere, or God is a cosmic creation, or God is a figment of my imagination, or God is whatever I want him to be in our 21st century uh, you know, naming of things, then why in the world shouldn't I use it or misuse his name? But God, and if he is, I am, then I've got a problem. Our culture has a problem because we violate it thousands and millions of times every day. We violate the name of Almighty God. Now, let me show you why it's important that we understand the name of God like this. As we go, Isaiah chapter 43 says this, 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, talking to the Jews. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, or Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, to, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, Yahweh, and apart from me there is no salvation. That's the crux of it that we have to understand. We have to understand that it is God who provides salvation. And you almost want to say to those whose Bible is only the Old Testament, the Jews, and we say, look what Isaiah 43 declares. It's in your book that I am is your Savior. And if you could only see that the final piece of the puzzle is that I am came to earth as Jesus Christ. I am put on the flesh. Shoot. I am was Jesus. And he is the Savior. He is the one and the only God. He is the one and only Savior. 
Well, I want to take a look at some of the names of God very quickly because, again, the names of God reveal the character of God. We'll look at just a few, and I wrote them down for you so you didn't have to try and spell them. Okay? Okay, it's not exhaustive, it's not comprehensive, but it, it is selective in, in this. The first one is Elohim, and that simply means creator. Remember Genesis 1-1, in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So the question really will, do you honor God as creator? Do you believe that God created, here's a nice word, two words for you, ex nihilo, ex nihilo, E-X-N-I-H-I-L-O, and that just means out of nothing. And those who follow Jesus and have a biblical worldview say that the world was created out of nothing. There wasn't something there that existed that God took and formed. It is that there was nothing that God said and formed all that he created. He spoke the world into being. If you don't believe that, he set the stars in space and he puts the planets where he wants them. That he in Christ holds everything together. Do you have a core and deep conviction in your heart concerning Elohim as creator? If you don't, when you take his name upon your lips, you misuse his name because his name is creator. El Elyon. El Elyon. Two words. And it just means the God most high. You find that in Genesis 14 in the priesthood of Melchizedek. He was a priest of El Elyon, a priest of the God most high. The name emphasizes the sovereignty and the rule and the power of God. So ask yourself, do I believe in the sovereign, powerful rule of God? Do I worship and understand El Elyon, the God most high? And if I do, then why do I complain so much about my circumstances? Why do I doubt his ability to intervene on my behalf if he is the God most high? He is Yahweh Jireh. Yahweh Jireh. Two words there, Yahweh then Jireh. The God who provides. Do you know the God who provides? You know where this comes from? It comes from a wonderful story out of Genesis 22, where Abraham takes Isaac, the son of promise, and he says, and he takes a few servants with him, and he, and he says, uh, because God has told him, he says, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him on the place that I will show you. And so they go. And they go about a three days journey, and then Abraham and Isaac, and he says to his, his the guys who come, his servants, he says, so you stay here, I and the boy will go yonder and we'll return and worship with you. Even though God had said, take your boy and sacrifice him, the dad said, the boy and I will be back. Why? Because he knew that the boy, what the boy was going to find out, that God was Yahweh Jireh, the provider. And so when Isaac looks at you, hey dad, we got the wood, we got the fire, but we don't have anything to sacrifice. I wonder what he thought when Abraham tied him onto the altar. And God, or Abraham said, Son, the Lord, he is the Lord provider. provider. He's Yahweh Jireh. And turning, they looked and saw a ram caught in the thicket, and that became the sacrifice. In a very realistic sense, that ram on the altar bore the place of Isaac, prefigured what was going to come and to happen centuries later when on a Roman cross outside the walls of Jerusalem they had another one would bear the place of another who deserved it and there bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood and sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior the Lord my provider The thing is that we have become so inoculated, if you will, against the godlessness or of the godlessness in our culture that we can sit there, we can stand there, we can just wait and hear the misuse, the abuse of the Word of God and it not affect us at all. Every once in a while I have someone, one of my patients, I'm, you know, there in hospice, but, uh, I have one especially, he's an agnostic, so every once in a while he lets some curse words fly. And uh, I, it sounds like he does more in, in the presence of my uh, colleagues than he does me, but he did this other day and he said, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you're a pastor, I shouldn't say that. And 
my initial thought is not, oh, it's okay, but really is, I've heard it before from a lot of people. I'm not at a point where I can say, you shouldn't worry about me, you should worry about God, because he really doesn't know if God exists, but there's a possibility that he does, so I can't rule out that possibility, so maybe he's there, and maybe I'll have a rude awakening when I meet him after I die. And I want to say yes, but again, we weren't at the point where I could get with that. You know, we say the name Jesus, it's said a lot in our, in our culture, but it's not about him, is it? According to the concise Oxford English Dictionary, the most common use of the name Jesus is as a vulgarity. Yes. Secondly, it is as an exclamation expressing surprise or impatience. And it also can be used to refer to the founder of Christianity. We profane the name of Christ, or we hear it all the time. People use it. Some people use it because they don't know any better. Exactly. They don't know any better. They don't know that he's El Elyon, the God Most High. They don't know that he's the provider. They don't know that he is Yahweh. We use it in such underrogatory ways. We do. We do. They don't understand what they're doing and saying. They it's don't. Okay. But that's not the point. The point is that we do. We use it like that sometimes. And we should know better. Well, let me go on on some other names. Yahweh Rapha means the Lord who heals. Yahweh Nisi means he is my banner. What does that mean? He, <laughs> God is my banner. He's the banner of the marching armies. It was, you, you say you have the protection of the armies around you. Around you. You're walking into things tomorrow, and so am I. You may walk into it and you wonder, I don't know if I can cope with another day going where I go. I don't know if I can go on that business trip, or I don't know if I can do another load of laundry. I don't know if I can make, you know, food and breakfast for my children or whatever I'm doing. I just don't know if I can cope. Well, there's Yahweh Nisi. There is the Lord is your banner. He's your protection in the storm. Get underneath the banner and walk forward because that's who he is. He's Yahweh Makadesh. He is the Lord of holiness. He is Yahweh Shalom. He is the Lord of peace. He is Yahweh Tzikinu. That means the Lord of my righteousness. Do you know that what it means to say that in righteousness I stand in Jesus? For we who are unrighteous and are dead in our trespasses and our sins, who follow the ways of the world and the wickedness of Satan unwillingly, unwittingly, without even knowing it, we are underneath the condemnation of God. But we can stand complete and unchallenged by God's holiness when we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we only can have the righteousness of Jesus Christ because He is my righteousness. And he has given it to us. See, there's no possibility whatsoever of standing in God's holiness except to face judgment unless there's one who takes our place. And when we stand before God and he looks at us, he looks at us through the holiness of Jesus Christ. For we are in Christ, in his righteousness, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And that's not so we feel good about ourselves, but so that we magnify Glorify His greatness. He is El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. We've even sung the song El Shaddai. Some of that's an older song, but you remember it. It just means God Almighty. And when we're singing that, we're magnifying the greatness of God, and it's a great song. And this morning we used and saw and sung songs magnifying His name. And it's not about the significance of G O D. It's about the fact. That God, in declaring and disclosing Himself, shows us who He is. And when we look at the names of God, and when He reveals Himself in, in Scripture, the names are full of instruction for us. We need to realize that the names of God are full of instruction. They're not packed with magical qualities or spiritual power. The reason the name of God is so significant is not because his name has magical quality. 
There were people who used, they wanted to know how Hebrews pronounced the way, name of God or pronounced these things. They wanted to get it just right because they thought if we get it just right, then we can use the name of their God to make sure that what we're doing happens. We have to get the conscience right, the vows right. And when we do look, it worked. And that's no, it doesn't work that way. And the reason the name is so significant is not because the name possesses magical power, but because the name is full of doctrine. God reveals himself in the names. He teaches us some things there. Solomon was wise when he says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are saved. What does that mean? I mean, we know it's metaphorical, right? Because where do we find a strong tower that we can run into? And what does it mean? And the name we can run there, why? Because when we say, I can't go, we can remember and we can trust in and we can run to and lean on the whole idea that the Lord provides His name. I run into that truth and I hide. And when I'm confronted by my sin and I can see no reason why God should welcome me, I run into the fact that God in Christ and that great atoning sacrifice, what He did for me, I can run in that and be safe. When my heart is fluttering, my pulse rate is up, and there's a fearfulness in me, I can run into the truth that He is Yahweh Shalom, my peace. It is true, truth which gives substance to our worship, and it is in our worship which fuels our hearts and our minds for truth. We have to be careful that we don't become Christians all about slogans. We're good about slogans. But often they're slogans without understanding, and when the difficult times come, there's nowhere to run, because we can't hide in a slogan. But we can hide in the name of the Lord as He's revealed Himself to us. We have more than just a framework of who God is in our doctrine and teaching. We now have something besides that framework we can hide, hang on to it, and that is His name. And it is substance. And it is truth. Well, finally, we've come to how do you break this, this third commandment? How do we break the third commandment? And really, this kind of helps us maybe understand why this is important. Until we understand the importance of God's name, then the breaking of the commandment really has very little significance. We need to understand why this was so important for God to make it one of the Ten Commandments. Only when we understand it, and the, uh, the magnitude of what it means, then we can understand how we break it. Well, I can summarize it in three words. They're there for you. Blasphemy, perjury, and hypocrisy. If you want to reduce it, those are, those are big, you know, 25 cent words, and you need nickel words. I gave you some nickel words, too. Swearing, lying, and kidding. Every time we incorporate the name of God into the things that we are saying in order somehow to try and strengthen our words, yes. that's the God's honest truth. Have you ever said that? Why don't you just tell me the truth? I, I like to say this to people every once in a while. I don't think they catch it. They say, well, to be honest with you. And I say, well, of course I want you to be honest with me. I don't want you to lie to me, so go ahead and be honest with me. Then they forget what they were going to tell me. But, you know. but, you, but we get into that. That's the God's honest truth. And there really is only one truth, right? And that's God's truth. We don't need to add God's name to it. In fact, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't have to uh, swear. And you agree? Right. I swear to God. Again, I'm like... Okay, and if you're doing that, you're lying through your teeth, what are you doing? You're blaspheming God. I don't need you to, and in fact, I, again, when someone says, I swear to God, I want to say, don't, don't do that. Just tell me if what you're saying is true. 
that what you're promising is true. We abuse the name of God so many times. You don't realize you're bringing God into it to make your church, yeah. Well, we are. We do. We do. We blaspheme God when we use His name in anger or in arrogance and defiance of who He is. We misuse the name of God and take it in vain when we're lying or uttering falsehoods using God's name to back it up. It happened even in, in the Bible at times. In, in Jeremiah 34, we have the story of King Zedekiah. And he said that he would release and proclaim liberty to the slaves. And they invoked the name of God in doing so. And then God says to them, but then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his slaves. You said you would release them. You even said in God's name you will release them. We, we, we say that we will. And then we didn't. And we just took them back. And God's name was not glorified in that. It was profaned. We take vows. Think of the vows you've made in your life. Many of us have stood, and you know others, who've stood in front of a church, and they hear the words of a pastor, and they answer the questions, I do, and they say, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, keep myself only unto her, only unto him, so long as we both shall live. And the question we see is that they do not. They made a vow before witnesses, but they also made the vow before God. And yet often we, we play loose and fancy with the vows that we make and we profane the name of God when we do so. We misuse the name of God when we take it and joke with it or are hypocritical with, hypocritical with it in any way. You see, if reverence is fundamental, so that was really what it's part of it, isn't it, folks? Don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Reverence, this name, so if that is fundamental, then irreverence is dreadfully flawed. That means it is going, it is misuse, it is abuse, and we are, we are breaking the commandment. And even today, again, we hear it over and over and over, with not just Jesus. We hear people going, oh my God, or OMG. Since we're now using initials for everything, and I don't know what half of them are. The thing is, we can get, get caught up in that. When I was in junior high, and I get on the basketball court, and we, outside California, outside courts, lunchtime, grab a basketball play, we had games going. You make a bad pass, you said a bad word. You, you didn't make the shot, you said a bad word. You, you know, I mean, all of us did on the playground. I went home and I was playing with one of my brothers and I, I made a bad shot and I said a word and I did this and I said a word. Now, he's bigger. He's seven years older. So, you know, it's not like I could work him in close to the basket, you know. And he could do that to me. But one day I said that and he turned around and he stopped and grabbed the ball and he said, garbage mouth. I said, what? He said, you're a garbage mouth. And by the way, he was also my Sunday school. Now, I stopped cussing when I missed a shot. Not immediately, but it made an impact on me. We do it all the time, and we lose the sensitivity of it. Every time, though, when we're in service and I, we attend worship, and we worship God with our lips, but not our hearts, we break the third commandment. Every song that I sing using the name of God when I sing lies, when I sing superficially, when I do not engage in the reality of my being in it and what I'm doing, I'm just going through the motions and I know that that can happen. But when we do that, we break the third commandment. You see, it's only when we take God's name in praise and in study and in love and in carefulness and in obedience and in prayer and in confidence and in evangelism and thankfulness we begin to get on the flip side of the commandment. And that is expressed in the Lord's Prayer when He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You want to know how badly we abuse the name of God? I don't know that I've ever done this, but I've heard other preachers do it. But think about it. We, we talk about the little story of the boy who says the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father who art in heaven, herald to be thy name. And we laugh. 
And yet, when you think about it, we shouldn't say that. Holy is the name of God. You know, <laughs> I'm getting older. Someone will tell me their name. The next time I see them, I have to say, what was your name again? None of you are like that, I know. You are all perfect in that. I don't know your name. And, and then they tell me. But you know, some, some of you here might, this morning in relation to all this, your response to God is, I don't know your name and I've never met you. Because you don't know it. You don't understand it. What he means when he said, I am. When he reveals to us all these other things and characteristics about his name, about his mercy and his love, and that's who he is. I told you to read, don't go there, Exodus 33. I do want you to read. I want you to go there and what God says about Moses. It just struck me. He said, I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. And it talks about Moses going into the tent of meeting. And it says that anybody can come to the tent of meeting. But when Moses went, all the people got out of their tents and stood at their tents. And when Moses went into the tent of meeting, either the cloud or the pillar of fire would come at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the people by their tent doors would bow down and worship. And it said that God met Moses there and spoke to him as man does face to face. And what really got me is I, as I read that last night again, and just kind of poured it, just, what is this story about? And God says, I know you. I know you by name. And the problem we have is that we don't know him. And we don't honor his name. If we know him and he knows us, then we need to honor his name. And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. That's who he is. And it's only when we encounter Christ as Savior that we meet God. There are all kinds of ways to come to Jesus. There's only one way to come to the Father, and that is through Jesus. And when we meet God in that way, and only when we meet God through Jesus Christ, then we begin to understand why his name is to be hallowed, is to be holy. So that may be the point of conclusion for us, or maybe for some of you, it becomes the point of beginning as you understand who God is. Now, don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Don't misuse his name. And if you have, it's all right to confess it. You don't have to do it out loud. But I bet you if you think about this week that there were times when you misused the name of God. He will forgive you. If you do not ask for forgiveness, there will be consequences. Yes. Pray with me. Father, the consequences that you speak of in your word having to do with Jesus Christ are eternal consequences. If we know you, if you are our Lord and Savior, if we've come to you confessing our sins, confessing that we can't do anything to merit your righteousness, we cannot be perfect. But when we come and confess that and accept what Jesus has done for us, on the cross, shedding his blood for us to pay for our sins, and we are given his righteousness to stand before you. And if anybody here has not done that, if they have not asked for forgiveness, they have not come to you and asked for you to come into their life to reveal yourself, and the consequence is eternal death, separation, presence of God in a life-giving situation, but eternity being separated from that love, but experiencing God's wrath. 
how Father, how no one here, no one here is headed that way, but that we all, all of us, know you. And if we know you, Father, your spirit is within us, and your spirit convicts us of sin, and he says to us, this is what is right, this is God's way, and when we go our way, may that conviction hit us, and may we ask for forgiveness for your faithful and just to forgive us our sins when we confess them and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, maybe today we think more of what it means to misuse your name. And then you don't say, I've kept the third commandment because I don't cuss. If there's something else convict us that we might see and that we might honor and make your name holy in our lives glorify you by acting as if you really matter. May your spirit move even now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah. 100